All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the balance feature. And I'm really um, excited for everyone who's watching to meet a, a good friend of mine and um, a former colleague um, by the name of Lori Van Dam. Welcome, Lori. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited you agreed. Um, I think uh, it's a super important time for us to be chatting for so many reasons. Um, so many reasons. Uh, but most importantly, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Lori is the regional VP for the Northeast for Susan G. Coleman. That's a brand new title. Uh, yeah, it's just about a month old. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Lori has been with Coleman for over five years now, I believe. Yeah. Um, she was, yeah. she came on board as the CEO of Coleman Southern New England, which included Massachusetts and Connecticut. And then you uh, merged with the other three New England states and became Coleman New England. Exactly. Uh, and then most recently um, became part of the larger Coleman organization. Is that right? Exactly. So Coleman as an organization has really um, recognized that in order to be able to deliver our mission as efficiently as possible, that we should be a single operating unit um, so rather than having 60 separate affiliates and a headquarters, we're going to become one um, big organization that works in concert, which will be, uh, I think, really, really awesome. Um, and so the New England affiliate was one of the first to fold in. Um, and that process will continue probably for, I don't know, six, nine months, something like that. That's awesome. Welcome, welcome. So uh, Lori and I actually worked together as, as part of the or Coleman organization. I served on the board for Massachusetts for eight years. Um, and she has been an amazing asset for the organization, helping them move very gracefully through a lot of change over the last five years. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about Komen. And then if it's okay, I wanna share some, some stats about breast cancer. So um, Komen actually funds uh, research for better cancer treatments, breast cancer treatments, um, and also um, patient support for things like diagnostics, uh, assistance, screenings, um, most importantly, screenings, mammography, which is really yeah. important. Um, and we are celebrating Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So now is the time to not only make people aware, but really invest your uh, time and your resources into helping organizations like Coleman um, do the things that are, have made breast cancer, uh, more manageable for people like myself. Um, I actually finished radiation right. yesterday. Woo! Congratulations. I know. Isn't How it? How are you feeling? I'm feeling amazing. So, and one of the things we're going to get into this, but, um, right. So I, I was diagnosed in July, as Lori knows, um, I went through a lumpectomy in August and had four weeks of radiation uh, starting in September and just ended yesterday. Uh, my treatment was incredibly manageable because it was caught early. And so we're gonna get into that, but that's gonna be, for me, that is the biggest message is early screening mammography um, is the most important thing when it comes to breast cancer because when it's caught early, it can be treated and treated really, really more manageably than, you know, more advanced cancer. So let's talk Absolutely. a little bit um, about some of the statistics. So one in eight women will develop invasive breast cancer in her life. Uh, breast cancer- In the United States. In the United States. Okay, good. Yep. Um, it's the most common cancer among women in the U.S. and around the world, right? Except um, for melanoma, but yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I did not know that. I took this right off the Coleman website. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, I think melanoma is like in a slightly different category. So it doesn't okay. count because it's like, you know, like very localized. So okay. of the major of the cancers, cancer. breast okay. cancer is the most common. Yeah. So every two minutes, someone is diagnosed with breast cancer in the US. Yeah. True. Um, in 2020, 276,000 new cases of invest, inv invasive breast cancer are expected to be uh, diagnosed in women in the U.S. 85% um, of breast cancers occur in women who have no family history of breast cancer. Right. That is huge. I mean, that is me. Um, and yeah. when I went into this, when I was part of Komen, I remember thinking, 
I, you know, I am on the low risk category, no smoking, mm. you know, mm. you take great care of myself, exercise, right. you know, lead a, a clean life, whatever that might be, no history on either side of my family. And I got it. And I never right. really knew that 85% of breast cancers are not hereditary. So that's important. Um, and then obviously regular screenings with mammography result in 30% fewer deaths from breast cancer. Huge. Yeah. Huge, huge, yeah. huge. Um, okay. Yeah. So Lori, what are the biggest issues facing breast cancer today? So uh, your statistic for uh, national diagnoses, it's sometimes helpful to bring it down uh, to a local area. So 12,000 women and men in New England diagnosed every year. Um, so what that means is that um, breast cancer touches so many families um, and uh, a huge issue always, but especially now, is access to care. Yeah. So um, as you were saying right up front, the importance of early detection in saving lives is enormous. Um, and if you are not able to get to your screening, um, particularly now, of course, screening is something that a lot of people have postponed, but even before COVID, um, we know that there are significant barriers for women of color, women who are not native English speakers, immigrant women, um, low income women. Um, and when breast cancer is caught later, the risk of a, a poorer outcome is increased. Um, and another thing that we know uh, is true that we're also really trying to work on is that if you uh, get a diagnosis and you delay starting your treatment, even if it's caught early, if you wait more than 60 days from the time that you're diagnosed to start your treatment, your outcomes are also likely to be worse. So wow. uh, patient navigation is, a, is the one really um, evidence-based technique that we have been able to find to help women get into treatment once they've had a diagnosis. Um, so uh, patient navigation is something that we are uh, increasingly funding directly at Komen. Um, so that's one intervention. Um, but another thing, if we take it even a step earlier in the process, um, breast cancer is unusual in the way it's diagnosed because you have your screening mammogram that you do every year, or every two years, depending on your age and your risk. Um, once that shows something, you're almost always brought back for additional screening because you can't go straight to a treatment plan from the results of a screening mammogram. So there might be an ultrasound, there might be an MRI, there might be a, a higher resolution um, mammography that's done. And uh, whereas under the Affordable Care Act, you can get your screening mammography for free, that is not true of the diagnostic mammography. So insurers can charge a copay, they can apply it to your deductible. And so a lot of women will delay even getting that second level of screening in order to get a treatment plan because they can't afford it. Um, so we are working both on the local level and on the national level, actually, on legislation that would require insurers to cover the diagnostic screening at the same level that they cover that initial routine screening that women get. That's um, hugely important. And I don't think, I mean, I don't think I even knew that. Like, so, so you go and you have a mammography, just like it's, it's your basic preventive care, right, for women right. over 40. And can we also talk about the recommended um, age sure. and mammography too. That's very complicated. It, it is very complicated. Um, so, so you go and have your mammography. So what you're saying is then they, they potentially see something they want to bring you back, but that's not covered. Um, and so many can, women will it, put yeah. that off. Exactly. Yeah. And that delay then increases the likelihood that they might have a, a poor prognosis. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's something that, um, you know, here in Massachusetts, we're actually working on uh, as part of the Boston Breast Cancer Equity Coalition, which Komen is a part of. Um, and that is really designed to uh, reduce disparities for women of color, because um, as I'm sure you remember, unfortunately, women of color tend to 
um, be diagnosed earlier with um, more aggressive forms of breast cancer, mm -hmm. um, uh, earlier in age, more aggressive forms and later stages. Yes. Um, and all of that contributes to a significantly higher mortality rate for African-American women compared to white women um, across the country, but, but also in Massachusetts. Oh. Um, so the, the way that we're trying to get at that is around reducing time to treatment through both legislative changes to enable women to access that care and then the patient navigation, because as you just experienced, if you are not uh, really well versed in how the medical system works, it can be very, very challenging um, to get your process put in place. And then imagine a woman who is either underinsured or doesn't speak English or has, uh, you know, children and parents that they're deal dealing with at home and no childcare. Um, so another place where Komen is really um, working to contribute is actually in our treatment assistance program where we provide cash reimbursement for transportation, childcare, um, medications, but now also since COVID, housing, food, and utilities um, to enable women and the, the men who are diagnosed with breast cancer, of, of whom there are a few, um, to get the care that they actually need. Um, so they can get, get better and get back to their lives. That is awesome. How, uh, how do people know that they qualify? How do they even find out about the program? Yeah, so that's something that we're really working on. Um, we have uh, historically funded patient navigators um, at Mass General, at Family Health Center of Worcester, at other um, medical facilities across the state. Um, and so those um, navigators are aware of the funds that we have available, um, but we're really trying to put together a more comprehensive package of materials to make sure that all the social workers and all of the patient navigators um, are aware of these funds because, um, you know, we're very fragmented. Our medical system is extremely fragmented and, uh, and getting the word out is challenging, but it's something we, we think is really important. That's, that's awesome. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about COVID. How mm. has COVID, you, you started to talk about it a little bit, um, how has COVID affected breast cancer this year? Yeah, so um, we can start at the, at the highest level, which is that a lot of women who would have had a mammogram on the books either were unable to go because their medical facility was not open or chose not to go once those facility, facilities reopened for fear of being exposed to COVID. Um, and the message that Komen actually put forth early on in the pandemic was, please delay your screening for now. We just don't know enough about how COVID is transmitted. And so uh, we think that the safest course is for people to hold off. Um, and then once medical facilities, you know, we started to understand more about transmission and what we could do to keep people safe, um, we came back out and we said, okay, uh, we now feel that the risk of delaying screening is higher than the risk to someone of going to get screened and uh, potentially exposing themselves to COVID. So we are very much now on the bandwagon of um, encouraging people to resume their regular screening. I had my mammogram last week. Right. Um, it was very safe. It was very easy. Um, it was uh, definitely new procedures that were in place to mm -hmm. Um, protect everybody, but I think they work very, very smoothly. And I encourage people to reach out to their um, radiology practices or wherever they're going to find out what um, measures are being taken in order to keep you safe while you're also um, getting those really critical screenings. So screenings is obviously one big area because, um, you know, all of those people who should have been screened they are now trying to slot into already full schedules yes. because people, you know, I schedule my mammogram for the next year as soon as yeah. I finish the one I've just had. So, you know, you can't, it's not like there's all this extra capacity that you're finding um, for people to move into. So um, what we are seeing is actually that uh, a lot of uh, medical practices are becoming more flexible in their hours. They're offering evenings, they're offering weekends. They're really trying to make, um, screening as convenient as possible because they know that you know there's there's this backlog that they're trying to to help folks work through so that's one aspect um 
obviously there's an enormous amount of job loss that has happened. And with job loss comes insurance loss. Um, so uh, a huge risk factor for late stage diagnoses is going to be that there are gonna be a lot of women who uh, because they can't afford it or don't know how to access uh, free mammograms, which are available, um, are going to either delay screening or delay treatment uh, because of the, the health insurance impact that COVID has had on them from a job loss. Yeah. Um, so that is a, a huge worry. Um, and, you know, again, we're, we're trying to do what we can to provide financial help um, and also kind of patient navigation help to get people um, who are not necessarily used to not having a private health insurance from a, from a job yeah. um, to help them kind of navigate that process. And where um, can people go if they are not insured and they need to have their mammograms? So we have uh, in Massachusetts and in fact, in, in uh, across the country, there's something called the National Breast and Cervical Early, National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, in Massachusetts um, has done, uh, it does provide free mammograms at sites across the state, um, but also um, has provided patient navigation because of having had um, universal health care for longer than the rest of the country. Um, typically, as a state, we haven't needed to use those funds as much to provide free mammograms, but they are there. Okay. Um, and if any of your listeners are trying to provide um, support for someone that they know or they themselves need a, a mammogram um, that they don't ha have the funds for, they should just reach out to us at 1877 go and we'll connect them with a local provider. One eight seven seven go Coleman. Okay, we go will, Coleman. We'll put those in the notes as well so that people awesome. can access that. That's great. Um, so let's go back to the question of when women should get screened. Now, mm. um, when I turned forty, it was the standard that at forty you start your mammograms unless you were high risk um, or had had breast cancer before the age of forty. Now it's it's all over the board. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. Um, it's very difficult because it's very confusing for people to try to juggle which of the various recommendations they should follow. Um, and uh, Komen does not actually endorse any particular um, uh, schedule. That's not kind of in our wheelhouse. So we can say to you, look, the, um, uh, the guidelines are anywhere from uh, every year to every other year starting at 40, starting at 45, starting at 50, ending at 74, ending at 80. Um, so uh, what we really try to help people think about is their own personal um, belief system. Because if you are the kind of person who says, I want to know, like I would just much rather know. And then even if there is a risk of a false positive, um, and I might get upset for nothing, I would rather be proactive. And there are other people who say, you know what, unless you're pretty confident that I'm gonna have to do something, I would rather not have that hanging over my head all the time. Yep. So, you know, if you're the second kind of person, maybe you start screening at 45 or 50. If you're the first kind of person, maybe you start at 40 and you do it every year. The, the thing that Komen is really behind and which I also personally really believe is it should be between a woman and her physician. Okay. And that insurance should cover whatever the cadence is that a woman and her physician together are able to establish. Um, but, you know, you think, I think when you're younger, you think, well, everyone thinks like I do, don't they? And then you go out into the world and you realize that you know, there are lots of different ways to think about risk and to think about. Yeah information um, and we really want women to do what's comfortable for them and what fits into their kind of way of living their life. Yeah, and so it's most important to have that conversation with your primary care physician. And, Absolutely. Um, you know, make sure- And think about your own values too. You know, we sure. have a, a tool that we developed that was sort of a series of questions around um, you know, things like if I find out later that I had cancer that could have been detected earlier, would I be upset or would I feel like, well, you know, that was a choice that I made, you know, like those kinds of like, am I the kind of person who would rather 
have a, a risk of over information and possibly bad information, or I'm the kind of person who rather has, um, you know, kind of peace of mind, right? Yeah. Like, how do you define peace yeah. of mind? Those are all things that, um, you know, we all believe that that the more self knowledge you have, the the more you can be a, a great advocate. Absolutely, I think that's the most important thing is to be educated and informed, and to advocate for yourself, whatever it is that you believe. Um, exactly. I love that. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about what um, what Komen is doing. What talk a little bit about some of the projects you're working on and some of the other uh, opportunities uh, that are happening that are just really exciting right now. Yeah. So as we discussed, we're kind of in the middle of a reorganization, um, which uh, is really exciting and is, is creating really cool opportunities. So now that I'm working with the whole Northeast, um, we're really thinking about the region and how we can um, kind of leverage what is available here. One of the things that um, makes working at Komen in the, in the New England area particularly really exciting is we have a ton of research that's happening here locally. Um, and uh, in Massachusetts, in uh, New Hampshire, and also in Connecticut, we have Komen scholars and researchers who um, are doing kind of the gamut of types of research, everything from basic biology research to you know, very specific um, uh, research around how to either provide better treatments or reduce the risk of recurrence. Um, and uh, we are able to tap into those researchers who uh, can then come and speak to constituents and, and fundraisers, people who are helping us to raise the money that we so desperately need to be able to provide all of these services. Um, so for example, last night we had a, a virtual event and uh, Dr. Lajos Pushtai from Yale New Haven Cancer Center came on the, the video and, and shared the work that he's doing. Um, and he uh, gave some really exciting kind of updates on where he sees the future of um, breast cancer treatments in the next five or 10 years. Um, and we could ask him questions and, and really get a sense of what it's like for him um, tangibly right now in research um, in an academic institution. Um, so we're able to really kind of bring the fundraising piece, which is critically important, and the research piece together mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a really fun way. Um, obviously, it's October. October is when we have a lot of events. So this year, we're actually doing virtual More Than Pink Walks, which is our kind of um, signature fundraiser at Komen. Um, and ours is going to be on October 24th this year. I am registered as a participant. You are registered as a participant. Mm -hmm. We're going to walk where we are on the morning of the 24th. Um, and uh, we encourage everyone who wants to get involved to either register or donate to a participant. Um, and we're going to have a whole, you know, video program with speakers and, um, you know, some uh, really inspirational messages um, from folks who are impacted by breast cancer and who Komen has been able to help. Um, and you know, that is, uh, it's been interesting to see how the fact of being virtual is actually, you know, of course, in some ways it's terribly sad because we love to get together and see each other and hug each other and, and celebrate together and remember those that we've lost together. Um, but there's something cool about people not having to travel where we're seeing um, people participating really across the region in a way that we haven't in the past. So we have folks who are doing, doing the Vermont walk, but they live in Maine or they yep. live in New Hampshire. And we have people doing the Boston walk who live in Rhode Island. Um, and they're all just going to go out and, and be part of this, um, on social media. You know, yep. I know, you know, I think social media is very much a mixed blessing. It's not yes. a, a universal good by any stretch. But in this context, it really does help to replace some of that energy that you get from being in the same space together and, and you know, kind of leaning on each other. Um, so we feel good about how it's, um, it's actually working. And, and what we find, for example, is for some of our corporate partners, um, they're so hungry for opportunities to bring their employees together. Yep. Um, and so these kinds of events where they can get a team together and do things as a group, even socially distant and, you know, through Zoom, 
um, has actually been really, really valuable, which has been fun to see. I, I can't wait for it um, because uh, I have actually gotten my my husband and my eight year old are going to walk with me. We've got a pink Fabulous. wig. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think you're right. We can take to the streets wherever we are. And I think um, it just broadens the reach um, and the opportunity for people to participate where they are versus, you know, having to drive, which I think is always, no matter what organization you're in, it's always an issue. If people have to get in the car yep. and go somewhere, they're less likely yep. to do it. If they can walk outside their front door, uh, mm -hmm. they're more likely to do it. And I, I just think it's a huge opportunity for Coleman's um, message to get yep. out in a much bigger way. There's so exactly. many cool things we can do on Insta stories and yeah, uh, Facebook, Facebook and live, absolutely. All of, all of it. Um, and how yeah. fun, you know, it'll be, I'm really looking forward to it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we are too. And I think what's, what we've learned through this by accident, right? Yeah. Nobody anticipated that this was going to be a thing we were going to do is that we probably will always keep a virtual component even when we are able yeah. to come back in person because it just, like you said, it just broadens the reach and allows us to be with more people. And it makes us less weather dependent. And you know how weather dependent these big outdoor events are. Yeah. And, uh, you know, having a little bit of wiggle room, if you don't happen to want to do it on the 24th, you can yeah. walk on the 25th or the 23rd. Yeah. Um, that also, I think, will will really change the game for us going forward. And logistically, I just think it's it's obviously so much easier to pull off. Um, and, for sure. You know, why not invest those resources in you know, all the good that you're trying to do versus, you know, exactly trying to put on a live race. Um, how do people sign up? Where do they go? So uh, right now we're still at comannewengland.org. Um, eventually we'll be on coman.org. Um, but uh, if you Google more than pink walk and your state, you will find it. Okay. Um, and registration is super easy and free. Um, and uh, in this virtual environment, uh, we do, of course, uh, encourage everyone to fundraise and we'll send you a really cool t-shirt if you raise a hundred bucks. Yay. I think I'm up to like 900. Oh, you're beating me then. I'm like, I'm stalled at 665. My sister says she's sending me money, but I haven't <laughs> seen it yet. So I'm, I'm hoping a thousand is my goal, so I'm working on it. You know, that's the other thing too. I mean, it's so easy to donate. It's so easy so to easy. participate. I mean, send one email out, people click on it. All they need to do is put their, their credit card in there. There's no, you know, sending of checks. I mean, it's just so easy. Put it on social media. It's a click away. Um, Absolutely. Super, super easy. And if you don't want to donate, please walk. Please yes, walk, bike, absolutely. run. Yeah, sure, really do whatever. whatever absolutely. I think it's 6,000 steps. Is that right? I mean, we're, there's different, you can choose what it is that you, what distance you're comfortable with. And we're also, a lot of us are on the app now and already walking. Um, so, uh, as you know, personally, I, I try to walk most days and, um, in this season, I've been really thinking about individual people that I know who've been diagnosed or who are, um, you know, having challenges in other ways. So, um, uh, it's kind of like a nice lead up to the day itself. I love it. Lori, is there anything else you want our community to know about, uh, Coleman? and what Coleman is doing to support the breast cancer. Yeah, so I love talking about the research that we're funding. I think it's so exciting and fascinating. And um, I told you about Dr. Pouche, who uh, is really doing cool things with immunotherapy mm. um, for metastatic disease, um, which is great. But my, if I'm allowed to have a favorite, I have a favorite researcher. Um, her name is Dr. <laughs> Regina Barzilay. She is actually at MIT in the Media Lab. And she is an artificial intelligence expert. She's a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient. Wow. Um, and she herself was diagnosed with breast cancer a few years ago and uh, went to the Mass General. And they said, well, you know, based on what we see on the mammogram, this has probably been growing for a couple of years. And she started thinking about, well, 
how come if Amazon can tell me what magazine or what, what movie I want to watch next week, how is it that we're relying on humans looking at these films to try to understand when someone has a cancer that's growing? So she uh, put her powers to work um, and is working with the Mass General and um, has figured out uh, how to read the mammography films where she can actually show you her cancer three years. And because the thing about mammograms, right? You have them every year. So she could go back in time and say that thing, which a human could not read as cancer, the wow. machine can. So the first thing is to detect cancers earlier, which is of course, as we've just said, super important. Um, but she's such a big thinker. So her actual plan is to build models so that you can get your baseline mammogram at 40. Mm -hmm. And with that, she can give you an individual risk assessment to say your likelihood of developing breast cancer in two years, three years, five, 10 is X, which then means you should have this screening cadence, which solves the problem that we were talking about earlier about how do I decide yeah. when I should get screened. Because right now we have these very rough ideas of what increases your risk for breast cancer. Yes. We've already said family history is not particularly predictive. Yeah. Um, we know that if you have a BRCA mutation, obviously that is a very tangible risk increase. And there are other genetic mutations that um, increase your breast cancer risk. And actually Dr. Pushtai last night was talking about how some of it might be interactions between a bunch of genetic mutations. So, you know, down the line, as we continue to learn more about how the genes play a part in whether or not you develop cancer, it might be about these interactions in a lot of different genes rather that's, than one single. That's crazy. Mutation. Oh my God. So crazy. Um, but she's saying, you know, ultimately she'll be able to give you a personalized risk assessment and then you will have a cadence that is that is actually accurate for what your risk is rather than going off of, well, you're, you know, you're overweight. So that's a risk factor. You drink alcohol. So that's a risk factor. Um, you're uh, over 40. So that's a risk factor. I mean, these are very broad categories that yeah. we're working with today. Yeah. Um, and the models that we have uh, that we can currently use for ass assessing breast cancer risk were developed on white women in England in their 60s and 70s, yep. 30 years ago. So they are basic, they're actually worse than chance for African-American women. Oh my God. So she has no plans other than to revolutionize how we think about breast cancer risk and how we assess it. Um, and she has said to me, uh, nobody would fund me to do this work because I'm not an MD. So I it came sounds to like Komen you just need to be a, a data like, science. Sure. <laughs> It's I mean, like, honestly, she's going to create an algorithm that basically says based on your baseline and all of these other factors around who you are and your lifestyle, it's going to lead you to X. Exactly. That's amazing. Yeah. It's so cool. And she so just got uh, the inaugural um, prize that's being given out by an artificial intelligence company. It's a million dollars. Um, for uh, recognizing work that is using artificial intelligence to improve human existence. And she's the first recipient. Oh so now you understand God. why she's, she's my secret favorite. Not so secret favorite. Yeah, not, not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Amazing. I need to meet her. She is sound. Oh incredibly. yeah, we're going to figure that out. She's, yeah. She's so cool. And did she, I'm just curious, did she start thinking about this as a result of her own cancer or yeah, totally. Wow. Yeah. What was she That's, doing? It's before? not, Oh, big data machine learning, yeah. artificial intelligence, yeah. things that I can't wrap my brain around at oh all. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing too, is so much of the research dollars uh, that Coleman puts out there come right back into Massachusetts. So I think, absolutely. you know, we're super fortunate here in New England because we are the recipient of so much of that money that goes towards research for all of these types of programs. Um, absolutely. It's now we're, we're incredibly fortunate that we have such rich 
research that's happening in Massachusetts. And um, because they're right here, we have a, an opportunity to um, to talk to them and, and hear what they're working with and what they're finding. Um, and I've been, um, you know, you, you think of researchers as people who are all about their data and their, and their um, you know, not good with explaining to lay people. But my experience of the researchers that we fund is that the vast majority of them are super engaging and really able to um, bring it down to a level that I can then grasp and retail, yeah. which is, yeah. um, I think, maybe unusual. But um, every time I talk to someone who's funded by Komen, they say to me, um, you know, we really feel strongly that the funding that comes from foundations is critical because funding that comes from the government has tons of stipulations around it. Sure. And they always want you to have something proven, which is understandable, but foundation funding, like what Dr. Barzilay got from us, gives you the chance to have those big picture ideas um, that you couldn't get funded any other way. And that's why having a, an organization like Komen is so important in the research mix because we're able to fund real breakthroughs in a way that the federal government just isn't able to. Um, and that's something that makes me really proud. And one last thing, because I, I think this is so powerful. Um, we also are very focused on early career researchers. Um, so we have specific programs to help people who are just getting started, maybe starting their own lab um, to get funded, which is crucial because uh, that funding has really dried up at the federal level. And what happens is if they can't get funded, then they leave research. And whatever genius ideas they have are lost. Yeah. Um, and there's a, you know, some, I'm gonna get the specifics wrong, but let's say you do uh, the work in your 30s and 40s that earns you a Nobel Prize in your 60s and 70s. And if you're not doing that work in your 20s and 30s and 40s because you weren't able to get funded to get started, then we don't have access to your inventions and ideas. That's um, so that's another aspect that that Komen has been very consistent about funding that it, that's very important to me personally. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Lori. I know. It's good stuff. It's really good. No, it's my pleasure. I'm so thrilled to have had this time to talk to you. Me too. I just love hanging with you. Yeah, me <laughs> too. All right. Have a great day. Thanks you for watching. You too, be well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Ciao.